Good evening, friends, and welcome to the 2021 Michigan football season kickoff on this, the 204th birthday of the University of Michigan. My name is Eric Hulkman, and I'm super excited to be a part of this special event to kick off the football season. We are so excited to have the best college football fans in the nation here with us today. Now, over the next hour and a half, we'll be diving into in-depth discussion, team analytics, trivia, a live auction benefiting Chad Tuff, and surprise cameos from former players. Now, if you have a question at any point, make sure you jump into the chat and ask those questions. The one thing I will say is if you've not done a ton of these, the default is to panelists. So it just sends it to people like myself. If you pick panelists and attendees, then all of us can see the questions. Now, before we kick off the kickoff, so to speak, I'd like to shout out our presenting sponsor, the University of Michigan Flint. Check out our chat box during the event to learn more about our sponsor, umflint.edu. What does it mean to be a Wolverine? It's the tenacity in our stride, the victor in our spirit. Every day, we walk the path to discover our truth. With the soles of our feet, plant ourselves firmly as leaders. Never resting on this quest to question convention, our mission is more than making a difference. We are committed to the craft of inventing the future. Our future. Focused on forward movement, we know triumph and solutions. What does it mean to stand in blue and golden maze? It's understanding self-discovery and success. Knowing when you put forth your best self, the knowledge gained will help you exceed all expectations. Taking this journey means accessing the greatness you've been given to make it. UM Flint is more than a university experience. It's a testament to building courage, conviction, and resilience. Hail us valiant victors. Our mission is more than making a difference. Being a Wolverine means being committed to uncovering knowledge, then giving that wealth of your best self to a world that needs you. It means learning in a place where you can create a future you can proudly look forward to. Your future. Our future. Go Blue. And on behalf of MLive and everybody in attendance today, we thank our sponsor for making today possible. And speaking of today, we are about to jump into the live auction. We're going to have it going on all day. And my dear friend Q will have his eagle eye on what's going on through the auction for the next hour and a half. Q, how are you, my friend? Tell us a little bit more about Chad Tuff and what we're going to be doing today. Eric, I'm excited to be here. I've always wanted to be a pundit on a TV show, and apparently this is the closest that I'm getting. So I am Fair happy enough. to be the auction sponsor, or rather not sponsor, the auction uh, auctioneer this today. But um, we're really excited about this and the fact that we have this auction to, to donate the, rather support the Chad Tuff Founda uh, Foundation. Um, Chad, Tuff, Chad Tuff Defeat DIPG Foundation inspires and funds game-changing research that, uh, to discover effective treatments for pediatric brain cancer. And with an emphasis on uh, diffuse intrinsic um, pontine glaucoma, which is DIPG, um, powered by parents who have faced uh, a pediatric brain cancer diagnosis, um, many who have lost a child, and then also guided by a, sci a scientific advisory council made up of leading experts in the field. Uh, the foundation ensures that every dollar that they raise uh, and goes into it and possible is going towards that promising research um, everywhere in the world, really. Um, and it looks like we've got a video uh, from Lloyd Carr to learn a little bit more about the Chad Tough organization. Let's roll that, uh, roll that footage.
When Chad was diagnosed, I knew then that the outcome wasn't going to be good. I had the great fortune coaching a lot of battles, but none of them ever compared to losing Chad to pediatric brain cancer. What they endure, no kid, no family should ever have to witness. So Q, why don't you tell them a little bit more about what we have to auction off today to support Chad Tuff? Oh, I'm excited about this. So in order to support Chad Tuff, we've got three signed footballs from University of Michigan football legends. Um, on that auction block, we've got the first one is signed by Lloyd Carr himself. We've got an, a second football that you're getting a trifecta. You're getting Lloyd Carr, Jim Harbaugh, and Jake Long. Um, and then that last one that we got is signed by Jay Freely. Um, so we've got those three there. Uh, we just uh, dropped the link in the chat for that. So that auction is open. Um, I'm going to watch the activities throughout the program that we've got. So I'm going to give you guys a couple of updates on what we're seeing uh, out here on the field. But just to uh, give you a quick snapshot, uh, right now that Lloyd uh, Carr football um, with Jim Harbaugh and uh, Jake is going for 281. We've got the one signed by Lloyd Carr for 100. And we've got the last one uh, by Jay Freely going for $20. My goal today, I'd love to see us raise 1500 bucks for, uh, for this amazing foundation and to battle that childhood cancer. So uh, go ahead and hop in there, get logged in, start making some bids. Let's see what we can do to raise some money while we're learning about this wonderful season coming up. Back to you, Eric. Awesome, my friend. Thank you. We will check in with you a little bit later on. And let's dive into the end zone and get started with our main panel discussion. As a reminder, ask any and all questions in the chat and we'll have some trivia coming up and some giveaways as well as some player interviews. But right now, I want to introduce our very own sports writers. Up first, Ryan Zook, who covers the University of Michigan Athletics for MLive.com with an emphasis on recruiting. Aaron McMahon, who has covered the University of Michigan football team for the Ann Arbor News and MLive.com since 2017, covered the Detroit Pistons, the Tigers, and prep sports in the Flint area. And Andrew Kahn, who's covered the University of Michigan football and men's basketball teams for MLive since 2017. Before that, he was a freelance writer, and he appeared in the Wall Street Journal, ESPN, the magazine, and Newsday, among others. My friends, welcome to the program. How are you? Hey, it's good to be with you. It's good to see everyone here. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Great. The, the yeah, great to see you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, you happy to be here as well? Tell the people. I, I'm so excited for this. It's better than just talking with you guys on a regular podcast. So this should be a lot more exciting. Sounds good. All right. Well, let's get this, let's get this kicked off here then. Uh, great, great to be with you guys. As, as Ryan mentioned, we, uh, you know, we, we are the co-hosts of the Wolverine Confidential podcast as well. Uh, that's at least a weekly podcast. So we hope, uh, we, you know, we get some new listeners uh, out, out of this event, but happy to be talking about the Michigan 2021 football season. Uh, first, you guys messaged me right before we started this thing and said, scrap whatever you had to, to start this thing. We got breaking news. I was actually traveling today, so this is going to be news to me. What is it? Aaron, you want to tell me? Yeah, so we spoke to a couple of coaches and players today. A Michigan name, there are four captains for the team today. Uh, not huge surprises, but it is noteworthy nonetheless. It's going to be Aiden Hutchinson, Josh Ross, Ronnie Bell, and Andrew Vistardis. Um, you know, a couple of guys who were captains last year, so they're familiar names to many of you. Um, but they were voted by the team. Uh, and apparently that's different from what they did last year. It sounds like the coaches had a big say in the captains last year. Uh, this year it was purely uh, it was purely uh, teammates te team driven player driven. Uh, so those guys are the four. Uh, and then there's one note we haven't written about yet. Well, the story will be going up on MLive.com once we're done with this. Uh, Nikai Hill Green, uh, redshirt freshman linebacker, has won a starting job over Michael Barrett. Uh, it's noteworthy. Once I'm sure once we get in defense, we can dive more into linebacker. But it's uh, a pretty serious, significant uh, development on that side of the ball. I mean, I, I don't think Hill Green has any career snaps at linebacker at the college level. So for him to win the starting job in camp is a 
a little bit of a surprise, but he's been getting praise all fall camp. So I guess based off what the coaches have been saying, it's not that big of a su- surprise, but uh, his lack of track record, he kind of, he must have ascended big time over the off season and into the fall here. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Let, let's get this started with a, a big question right away. And that is, I want season record predictions from each of you and, and kind of why, uh, Ryan, I'll start with you because you have such Ooh, a fancy, back- it off. <laughs> you have such a fancy background. It's clear. You think, you know, you're better than us. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I mean, I am, but going to the predictions. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate that I know what you guys are have too. And we all kind of have the same, but going with seven and five this year. And the way I looked at it was kind of went down through the whole schedule and looking at the Ohio state game, Penn state and Wisconsin on the road. I mean, at this point, there's just so many unknowns for, for Michigan and, and basing off what we saw last year, I give Michigan a less than 30% chance at winning those games. And then I said, I'm thinking a toss up a one a split between the Washington game and Indiana both those games are at home, but against ranked opponents, at least in the preseason poll, I think they could probably split those games. And it's hard, hard not to say that they won't have a slip up uh, along the way elsewhere. I mean, with either if it's Michigan State on the road, Maryland on the road, I mean, Northwestern won the Big Ten West last year. I don't think they'll be as good. Um, but again, it, Mich- they always seem to give Michigan a, a pretty good, uh, pretty good fight. So I'm going with seven and five. Uh, I think the best case scenario is if they they win both those games against Indiana and Washington, win all the rest of the games they're supposed to win, and then I still think they'll probably lose those three against Penn State, Wisconsin, and Ohio State. So I think best rec- best case scenario nine and three, um, worst case scenario probably six and six. Aaron, yeah, I largely agree with everything Ryan said. I I said seven and five as well. Um, I I think there's definitive losses with the Wisconsin game and the Penn state game. Cause look, both of those games on the road, Michigan hasn't won there in a while. I mean, and those two teams, you know, are, I think are better than Michigan this year. Then you got the Ohio state game at the end of the year. I, that's going to be a, a game. I don't think Michigan stands a chance. And I, I know a lot of folks don't want to hear that, but it's the reality of the situation. So there's three losses right there. Um, and then Ryan mentioned toss up games. I, I think there's four of them. You got the Washington game week two, You've got Michigan State on the road in East Lansing this year. You've got Indiana and you've got Nebraska on the road. So I, I think, you know, I'm splitting it down the middle. I think Michigan, you know, wins two of those. Um, and they're seven and five. And I will probably get into a little bit later, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing as long as Michigan can show some improvement as the season goes on. They can show what they're doing defensively. Uh, and, and, and that's, I think that's what they're going to stand. And look, if you look at the odds makers, they have, I think, have pegged Michigan's win total at seven and a half. So that's right around, I think, where, where we're all thinking. Um, but I think it's more likely this Michigan team finishes six and six and eight and four. Um, there's just so many unknowns, so many things, you know, that Michigan needs to prove. Uh, and, the, and these road games are going to be tough. I, it, Michigan's going to have a hard, tough time, especially as, he's, as the year goes on. Yeah, I mean, okay, so, you know, this isn't, this isn't, you know, first take or some show like that where we're just going to disagree and argue for the sake of it. So, so be it. I've got seven and five as well. Uh, the, the games I'm leaning towards wins are, are some of the ones you've mentioned, the games I'm leaning towards losses are, are some of the same. And, and, and I feel the same way about, about the toss up. So that that's how I get to seven and five. Uh, we've got a question um, from Dan that kind of re- relates to, to this topic. And is the question is, does Michigan understand that a win over Washington puts them back on the map after so much negativity and that a loss will only validate the naysayers? Uh, yeah. Kind of put differently. It, it, it's a very important early season game. Yes. Second game of the year. And, and, and given what we mentioned about those other early games that we kind of view as, as wins, you could talk about, you know, okay, four and O get some real momentum, um, you know, with, with, with big 10 play heating up uh, or, or not. I mean, I guess, yeah. How, how do you guys see, see that one going, Aaron? Yeah, it, it's, going to be a key game you you mentioned momentum and i think that's a real thing and, and michigan very well start this year 4-0 I, I, that week two game against washington i think it's going to help determine the trajectory of the season um I, for unfortunately for michigan it comes in week two i think they're still going to be figuring things out at that point the defense certainly won't be what they want it to be um but the the one you know the one saving grace for them is the game is in ann arbor so washington does have to fly across the country from the pacific northwest 
to Ann Arbor. And that's no easy thing. I mean, you see teams all the time go out West for games and they lay eggs. They don't play well. The, the time zone gets to them. Uh, and that's a very real possibility for, for Washington. It is a night game. The game is going to be on prime time on, on television. So the spotlight will be on them. Um, you know, I, I don't know at this point, it's tough to say Washington will probably be ranked coming into this game. They got some guys coming back. So it's going to be a, it's going to be an interesting game. If Mich- I, I don't necessarily think Michigan needs to win the game to prove the naysayers wrong. If they can stay competitive and, and keep it a close game, one possession game, I, I think there's something to latch onto there. They might not have to win to keep the naysayers away, but they do need a win if they're going to on the recruiting trail. And I think that game is going to be huge for the rest of this 2022 class and moving into the 2023 class. Uh, there's some, some guys, uh, there's going to be a ton of visitors for that game that are going to be in attendance at the big house. Um, some of their top remaining targets in the 2022 class. A lot, a lot of the players that haven't committed yet that are still top. targets they want to see some stability comfortable about their decision to possibly come to Michigan so that game is going to be huge for them I know one really key recruit there is is uh five-star offensive tackle Josh Connerly he's from Seattle um Washington's Michigan's biggest threat on the recruiting trail for him uh he's expected to be at that game um if Michigan can pull off a, an impressive win there I mean that, that you, you could get some wins on the recruiting trail also by winning that game too um, which, which Michigan needs kind of right now. I know we'll get into recruiting a little bit later on, um, but, re- but that game's going to be a, a early season game to watch. Absolutely. And we're going to have, uh, as was mentioned earlier, you know, trivia questions uh, throughout this event with prizes. We got hats, we got shirts. Uh, this is not an official trivia question, but, but I'm going to ask Aaron and Ryan this. You guys know how many current Wolverines have ever made all Big Ten team? And I'm counting first team, second team or third team by the coaches or the media. So, so sort of any, you know, major recognition, uh, how many current Wolverines? Uh, Aiden is one. That's it. That's the list. That's the start <laughs> and the end of the list. So, I mean, when we, when, if you, if you hear our predictions and you're thinking maybe they're a little pessimistic, I mean, that that's kind of where it comes from is, is, is the, the roster itself. I mean, Aiden Hutchinson, uh, you know, defensive end third teamer in, in 2019. Um, you know, they had I two. I feel like they've got a lot of honorable mentions, right? Yes. Yeah. Pl- plenty of that. Um, so, you know, solid, but like even third team is, 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 should be is solid, not great. So like, you know, Ohio state is really good. Wisconsin, Indiana, Penn state are too. Like, I, you know, Iowa's not on Michigan schedule, but, but, but they are like, there's, there's reason to be, you know, not pessimistic so much, but, you know, a little cautious about, about Michigan this season, but we'll get into some of the reasons why, you know, they can, they can still, you know, exceed at least our, our expectations. Uh, and, and part of that's going to be the quarterback situation. So, you know, this is a position, of course, everyone wants to talk about uh, Cade, Mac- Cade McNamara, who you saw last year at, at times um, is all but been named the starter for this season. Uh, but you do have a five-star true freshman in J.J. McCarthy, and you have a, a transfer from Texas Tech with some, you know, the most college experience in Alan Bowman. Uh, you know, I guess we could start with Aaron kind of sorting this out and, and what you expect from, you know, the most important position on the field this season. Uh, before we get into quarterback here, I want to give a shout-out to Timothy Morris. That was a uh, great comment there about Mike Hart also being big Ten. <laughs> that is very true, although not as a player, now on staff as a coach, but I, I enjoyed that comment. Back to yeah. you, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the quarterback situations, I mean, it's, it's settled, but for now, at least, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's Cade's job for now. And I think the leash is going to be relatively long for him. Uh, they like, they like what they have in him. I mean, he's, he's like that bonafide leader, that rah rock guy that I think Jim Harbaugh has been desperately wanting for the last couple of years. He didn't really get that out of Shea Patterson. He's, he's more of a quiet reserve type guy, Joe Milton, the same way. So in a way, I think they look at Cade McNamara as being almost the total package. He can move the, the, the offense. He, he can ignite his teammates. Uh, and he's got those leadership qualities. Now, 
how long that lasts, I don't know. He's obviously going to have to go out in the field and show it. So the first couple of weeks, are, I think, are going to be very much a show-me type stage for him. Because, look, when you go back and look, he didn't play a ton last year. Like, he came in the game late against Wisconsin, um, started the game, you know, obviously against Rutgers and, and, and played relatively well. But, you know, it's also Rutgers, too. He got his first start. Keep in mind, his first collegiate start was the Penn State game. He came out injured. So they're just, they haven't seen a ton of him. He hasn't really faced that, that big time pressure, that moment that they need him. Uh, so I think you're going to learn a lot, of, a lot about him in the first few weeks. I think they're prepared to do that, roll him out there and see what they have. But I will say, you know, all accounts from talking to players, talking to coaches, they like his DNA. He's, he's like the quarterback. He, he is a quarterback. So, um, you know, he's the guy, McCarthy. I, I think they're going to throw in late in games just to see what they see how he how he fares. Um, but if McNamara is playing well, I don't think J- Jim Harbaugh necessarily looks at it like they need to throw McCarthy in there. They can save him for the rest of the year. I know folks probably don't want to hear that. Um, but you know, if you look at Jim Harbaugh's track record, and I've said this before, if you look at Jim Harbaugh's track record with quarterbacks in the past, he doesn't like playing them. You know, freshman year early on, he likes to he likes to bring them along. Get, you know, get them acclimated to the college game, and then eventually throw them in there. So. Bowman's interesting, and we've talked about him before. He's the most experienced guy. I think if he had come in earlier in the spring, he probably would have gotten more opportunity. But the fact that he didn't come in until late summer and hasn't start, didn't start practicing with the team uh, until fall camp kind of put him behind the eight ball. But I will say this, Michigan's quarterback situation is a lot better than it was last year. I think they feel more confident in it because even if Cade, go down, Cade goes down injured or struggles or whatever, they feel like they have other options there, something they, they, I don't think they really had you know, last year. Yeah, no, not at all. And what, what's going to be intriguing to me, I mean, obviously you don't want anything to happen to the starting quarterback, but it, not including like mop-up duty, but it, if something does happen to Cade, uh, gets injured, or I mean, obviously COVID could possibly play a factor again this year, possibly, who would be the number two in a serious situation, not just in mop-up duty? Would they go with the more experienced Bowman or would they put the pressure on J.J. McCarthy and say, hey, all right, here's the reins, kid. Uh, let's, let's see what you got. So, I mean, we don't have a clear depth chart right now, uh, obviously, JJ has had a laid up being in, being a part of spring practice and, and and taking that number two job into the fall. But maybe with Bowman getting more comfortable during the season, if he can kind of put, uh, elevate himself uh, ahead of JJ on the depth chart, we'll have to see. They they've got a real interesting situation. I don't think this is the first college team to have it, and it won't be the last. But you've got a guy in Katie who they like, but they brought in Bowman to fill the depth. But you've got JJ, who's supposed to be the future. So, like, you know, if things go wrong, like you mentioned, or or beyond this year, what they go, or what they do is is going to be interesting because Bowman's still got two years of eligibility, so he can hang around for another year if he has to. Everyone wants to see JJ thrown out there and, and playing. But if if you know if Kate has a great year, you're going to roll with him next year. So Michigan's quarterback situation, as I said, I think it's a better situation than it is. But you 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 start to wonder how long. Um, how, how they deal with these quarterbacks and manage them and how they play them. And that's, that's a task for a lot of coaches around the country, how you, you know, how, how you avoid alienating other guys who necessarily aren't starting, but, but they're talented enough to, to be thrown out there. One of the, the biggest gaps between Michigan and Ohio state has been at the quarterback position. I mean, this is, this is no secret, uh, you know, Michigan, as, as I mentioned, they've had, uh, you know, they've had some, you know, good quarterbacks, you know, kind of third team, uh, you know, type, type talents and all, all big 10, um, you know, Jake Rudock, his, his first year, we'll, we'll hear from him later uh, in 25 Harbaugh's first year, you know, in 2015 was very good. Uh, Wilton Spate was good initially, um, you know, Shea Patterson, some, some good years, like they've had some good quarterback play, but not like elite. Like, is there, <laughs> this, is, this is an important question and probably no easy answer, but like, is there a reason for that under Harbaugh, given what we saw, from him at previous stops, why he hasn't had that yet, and do you think he can with someone on the on the roster currently? You can answer that first, Zook. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, it, if if he can't with JJ McCarthy and a uh, guy with Alan like Alan Bowman who has previous experience, um, or a guy like Kate, like one of those three, you need to rely on in the next two three years to take that next step and, and be a top top two quarterback in the conference, at least. Uh, I mean, Michigan doesn't land top 25 overall recruits of the quarterback position every year. They brought in some good ones like Brandon Peters and and some other guys, uh, but no one to the level of JJ McCarthy. 
that's actually could be a trivia question here later on today. Stay tuned for that. But yeah, I mean, if, if he can't turn one of these guys into a, an elite level quarterback in the big 10, then I don't, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Well, let me say this because it, do, it doesn't answer your trivia question, but you know, just devil's advocate a little bit. I mean, McCarthy is like the number five QB in the class, just based on the 24 seven sports composite rankings. Okay. The best sure of, of that group you mentioned, but you know, Peters was six. I looked like, you know, McCaffrey was up there, like McNamara and, and Milton were top 10. Like they've had some other, you know, guys that were viewed as, as elite prospects nationally. And it, it still hasn't happened for him. So, but I get what you're saying. Like McCarthy has, has flashed maybe some potential that, that even those guys didn't. Brandon Peters is the one I think that really stings the most because when they brought him in, he was like a mid to high four star guy. He was one of those guys. I think he went to the opening. He was like one of those considered one of those top tier quarterbacks in the class. And they just weren't able to develop him enough and get enough out of him to where I think Jim Harbaugh felt comfortable throwing, throwing him in games. Now, if they would just roll with him and let him develop on the fly, maybe he would have turned into a, a decent level quarterback. Um, he's, he's done well for himself, in Illinois. He's battled injuries and the like. He's not surrounded by the, that certainly the, the type of ca- talent Michigan has, um, but they, they certainly whiff developing him and he's certainly not the first, um, but quarterback is, is, we talk about all the time. Quarterback is the most vital position in football. You're either going to win or lose with that guy. You're, you're either going to be a, a good team or you're going to be a middling team like Michigan if you can't develop guys. And that's been Michigan's story the last couple of years under Jim Harbaugh. They've brought in some guys who folks think are going to be these next tier, top tier guys. And, and Michigan staff has been unable to develop them. Uh, and that's where I think McNamara is his year here is going to be key to help. Maybe perhaps he can, you know, change that narrative a little bit. And then you've got JJ McCarthy behind him. Uh, but I really think this next year and what, you know, Cade McNamara does will go a long way. And I think helping, um, you know, push the narrative for Jim Harbaugh in terms of quarterback development. Um, I just want to let, you know, our viewers know, like we are seeing, you know, the questions that are coming in, you know, they're being, being filtered through and it, you know, trying to save some of them for, Maybe when we get to that per particular topic, of course, cannot promise we'll we'll get to them all, but you know we'll try try our best to answer uh, a bunch of them. Um, but right now, I want to move. We're talking quarterbacks, uh, so if you know we could we could play our the the interview that that I did with uh, former Michigan quarterback Jake Rudock. Uh, you know, right now that would be great. Um, you know, as I as I mentioned, um, you know, before, like. He, you could certainly make the argument and I, I will right now that, you know, he's, he has the best season, you know, at the quarterback position under Jim Harbaugh. And it was the very first one of, of Harbaugh's tenure at Michigan. And you no, know, he, he was, he was a transfer. Um, so, you know, we talked about some of those things, you know, the current team and, and his experience and uh, yeah, we can play that now whenever we're ready. All right, well, let's, let's talk some Michigan football here. Uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you played the 2015 season at Michigan under Jim Harbaugh. What stands out from your experience playing quarterback for Jim Harbaugh? I think the, the biggest thing is I hadn't had a quarterback head coach um, really ever, grow, even growing up playing Little League um, and then in high school and in college. And I think that was the biggest thing for me is the head coach was, a little more involved with me personally um, at that level, right? Um, he had played the position and he had been in all those different roles. You know, he had been at a big time program. He had he's gone in the NFL and that was, a, I think, a big help. And it was just, it was really nice for me personally because I you, you had an extra coach there, but also you had an extra coach that was the head coach that kind of kind of holds a little bit more weight versus, you know, sometimes you have a defensive minded head coach. So obviously they spend more time on defense but as a former quarterback to make the offense work and how we would flow through meetings and practice and all that. Gotcha. What is his, what is his approach, uh, you know, uh, coaching the quarterbacks? Is he, is he very hands-on? Is it, did, you know, is he, is he looking at the way you're throwing the ball and saying, Nope, this is the way all quarterbacks do it. Is it more, it's working for you. Let's yeah. Let's just, you know, fine tune it. Like, yeah. What, what <laughs> some of the nitty gritty, yeah, uh, definitely the opposite of a hands-off coach. So very hands-on. Uh, I mean, you guys see that in games. Um, I'm sure some of the practice tape that everyone's been able to see, and you can you kind of can tell he's very hands-on. He wants to be involved, and he is. Um, but as far as like the mechanics of it, there's some things that he may try to 
coach you on um, and other some guys maybe more so than others me personally um, it was more about game planning and very little things um, to actually like fix mechanics wise uh, really the one thing I remember was he just liked my shotgun stance to be squared up instead of like staggered like some guys because you know as a coach his idea is like well I don't want you giving anything away like I don't want it looking like you because the level he's gotten to and same thing in the NFL it's like guys notice a two inch difference between where your feet are um kind of how your hands work and stuff like just little things like that any little hint so I remember that was the one thing they was like yeah I want you squared up I was like yeah Jim that's fine I don't care I, I'll I don't really care how to get, <laughs> get a shotgun snap all squared up it didn't matter um yeah and then the NFL I was like okay I went back to like a stagger or whatever but it's just little things like that and then he just he, he, he cares so much and he wants to be involved and make sure everything is working well. So I think that's part of the, the quarterback end too, is you want to have your hand in everything so that it all can flow well. Yeah. Okay. Just for people that might not know, I mean, the idea was that not tipping off the defense to where the play or the ball might yeah. go eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Not, not to, not to have like, if your left foot was a little forward, your right foot all of a sudden to go, oh, maybe they're handing it off to the right or this or that. So it was just a, yeah, not to give any tips away to, to the defense. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. Fascinating. All right. So, so that, that, that season in Michigan, you know, your, your top three receiving targets were, were Amara Darbo, J.U. Chesson, uh, Jake Butt, all of, all of whom were drafted, drafted into the NFL, played in the NFL for several years. Like how, how'd you form a chemistry with those guys, you know, so, so quickly? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the biggest thing was just once I got there, so I graduated on Saturday I think it was May 15th. And then I was on campus on Monday morning. Wow. So, yeah. So we left Sunday late after I packed everything up and then got there early Monday morning. Um, I think the first thing was just getting there early and uh, being with the guys and kind of having the build a little bit of a friendship and build some camaraderie there. And then after that, I was just always trying to be available, you know, anytime they wanted to throw, anytime they wanted just to play catch or, or talk football, just always being in the building, especially that first that summer I was there, just because I hadn't had the built up rapport with them. So right. that was a big thing. And then, you know, in practice, always working a little before, working extra after practice. That's another huge thing. Um, and then at the same time, it still took a little bit of time in games because game speed is different than a practice speed. And I think that's something that you know, unless you're really in it, you don't fully understand how there's there's different levels of of kind of competition and speed and when you get into a game it's a little bit different guys think differently and you got to kind of figure that out so it still took a little bit of time and then you know for me I think it was that Minnesota game where I feel like as an offense we started to click and unfortunately I got my ribs obliterated um so <laughs> well and came in and did a great job up and found the defense had a great stop but that was, that was I, I'd say that was that game kind of where I felt like, okay, we're starting to roll on all cylinders on offense. I'm glad you can use the phrase ribs obliterated and laugh at the same time. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, fine. It happens. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah. So I mean, connecting it to, I guess this year's Michigan team, like it, it's not really obvious, like at this point, who, who those top pass catching targets will be for this team. Like, can mm -hmm. you give us some insight from your, your high school or college or NFL experience? Like, as to how that will be sorted out, you know, in practices or whatever leading up to the season, uh, or even even early in the year, like who who those main guys mm -hmm. will be. Yeah, I think a lot of that a lot of that really comes down to what the coaches are obviously saying. Um, and I, I'll go back to the to the example kind of before. It's with with games. It's a little different than in practice. Sometimes mm -hmm. there's a guy in practice who's doing everything right and doing a great job. Um, but maybe he doesn't have that in-game experience or, you know, sometimes that can affect them when we get to the game day. And then other times it doesn't affect them at all. So I think you'll, you'll kind of start to see, I mean, in college is different too, right? Like in the NFL, we have preseason games you, you, and not to mention, you kind of already know who your guys are going into it mm -hmm. or where they got drafted. Um, but in college, I think it's going to be a couple of games. You, teams kind of need a few games to figure out, okay, how are we working with our guys? Who's working well? Um, who do we want on the field or, you know, what routes do these guys run well? Because sometimes a guy is really good at two or three routes, but if it's hard to cover them, then those are the routes you're going to see. And then you try to expand from there because you want a well-rounded receiver. But 
you know, I think it, it will take a couple of games probably um, until you kind of figure out that and with the quarterback situation, who, who they're comfortable with. Cause I mean, you look at Tom Brady when he was in New England and even in Tampa, like if he can get to Gronk, he's going to get to Gronk. Like he has a built up rapport. He trusts them and they trust each other. So you're, you'll start to see that, but uh, it will take a little time, I think. All right, Jake. Well, well, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us tonight and uh, yeah, good luck with everything you're, you're pursuing in your career. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks to to Jake Rudock for doing that. Um, yeah, part of it was part of a longer interview where you know he did mention what he's doing right now is he's still he's still pursuing a you know an NFL career. He's 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 been in the NFL you know since leaving um, Michigan you know with a couple different franchises and a couple you know different different roles. Uh, he, he's he's not he's not done yet. He hopes his football days are not done, but in the meantime, he's also applying to various medical schools, including, including, uh, Michigan. So, uh, yeah, you know, good, good for, for, for Jake Rudock. Uh, I want to have, um, you know, our first, our first couple of trivia questions here, we're going to, we're going to have, you know, six of them throughout the night, giving away shirts, uh, and and hats, um, you know, periodically throughout this, this event. Um, and and our first two are going to be right now, for shirts. All right. I'm saying that that's what we're giving away for these is shirts, Michigan football shirts. Um, so I believe how it's worked, how it's going to work is you're just going to type your answer into the chat. Um, and the, the fastest one gets it, you know, I would say, Hey, you know, you can't be Googling this thing, but we can't stop you, I suppose. So, uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, but, but here we go. Here's our, here's our first trivia question. Uh, and you'll, you'll be contacted if you are the, the first one to get it right. Denard Robinson is the most prolific running quarterback in Miss Michigan history, amassing 4,495 career rushing yards, second among all players in program history. Who is the second leading rusher among quarterbacks in Michigan football history? You got Denard. You got to go down the list a little ways before you find the next. Oh, look at that. Someone already won. <laughs> we got it. I like to, I like to, you know, give a, give a little time quick. for people to get yeah, it in, really quick. but, uh, yes, it sounds like we've got some answers in there. Yes. Rick Leach. So Mike Hart, you know, also on the staff right now, as was mentioned, uh, is number one all time in, in, in career rushing yards. Denard Robinson is, is number two. And then you got to go all the way down to number 22 to find another quarterback. That's Rick Leach with 2,171 rushing yards, more less than half of, of Denard, but, uh, that is the correct answer. So, um, you know, some of our moderators will will contact uh, you know whoever whoever was was first and 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 right um, to to hook you up with that shirt. And we've got another one coming now as well. Uh, and and here we go. In December, J.J. McCarthy became the third five star quarterback Michigan has signed since 2000. Who are the other two? Looking for the other two five-star quarterbacks Michigan has signed since 2000. We've mentioned some of the other, uh, the other potential ooh. names that, that are recent, but you know, <laughs> to go back. Nothing yet. We're close. Nothing though, yet. Look at that. Oh, oh, no one's done the combination. There's I love two, following yeah. Ryan yeah. following the answers. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's so exciting. So, yes. Oh, 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 they're coming in fast now. I see. Yeah, that, there's some. There's some in there that are right. It's hard to tell who's first. Okay, some we've, we've, we've in, got but, we've got yeah. a correct answer in there, Ryan. You can confirm. Yes, I can. All confirm. right, Chad Henney and Ryan Mallett are the two other five-star quarterbacks Michigan signed since 2000. And you kind of kind of have both sides of the coin with that, right, Ryan? You got one that uh, you know was very successful and you know four-year career at Michigan, and and one that you know it didn't really work out in his best days. Uh, were, yeah, they were, were both elsewhere. successful, but one was elsewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. Let's, let's, we're going to have more trivia coming up, um, but let's talk, let, let's stick with, with offense. Um, and we can, you know, c- kind of combine some of the, some of the questions we, we've been getting here uh, as well. Um, you know, wh- one of them is about, uh, you know, maybe what unknowns, uh, you know, can exceed expectations that can, that can change some of those projections we made from seven and five to maybe give Michigan eight, nine, you know, 10 wins. Uh, another one was who will have a breakout season. Michigan this year so if if you know either you guys feel it could be on the offensive side um 
feel free to, to, to list that right now. Um, but yeah, we've got, you know, we talked a lot about the quarterbacks, but you know, I don't want to ignore the running backs, the, the receivers and the offensive line. Um, so yeah, Aaron, I'll, I'll give it to you to see where you want to take this thing to start. I've been really bullish and I've said this for weeks now on the offensive line, like they're deep, they're, they're legitimately too deep. And that's, I think a, a credit to the job Ed Warner did when he was here, just not only recruiting, but developing and bringing some of these guys along. I mean, you've got Ryan Hayes at left tackle and this will be his like second and a half year as a starter. I guess you can call it. Um, they, they like what they have there. I mean, they've played him a couple of years now. Uh, he's the athletic type of tackle they like, and Michigan has developed over the years. Um, you've got, Trevor Keegan or Chuck Filiaga at left guard. It's a competition. We haven't got word yet on who's going to play there. But the fact that Keegan is pushing a fifth-year senior in Filiaga is, is a good sign from a development perspective. Um, the next name I'm going to mention is fascinating because his, his name came up, Josh Gass mentioned him a few weeks ago, as potentially Michigan's potential best offensive player, and maybe not this year, but down the road, and, and that's Zach Zinter. Um, played guard last year. <clears throat> But Michigan thinks they can play him either center or guard. And I think that's really going to depend on, you know, what, what type of scheme they line up, how they want to play. Um, but you got and – then, and then battling him at center is, is another fifth – like a six-year guy in Andrew Vistardis. Uh, so they're, they're stacked there. Right guard is going to be Zinter, depending on where they want to play him, or Andrew Stuber, again, another, another fourth, uh, you know, a guy that's been around the program a while. Um, so they're stacked off, uh, from the offensive line perspective. So that should give Kay McNamara enough time to make appropriate decisions, throw the football, and not only that, but run the ball. And I think that's maybe the underrated thing Michigan has coming back. We can get into that now or whenever you guys want to talk about it. But the running back, to me, have the highest ceiling here. Like Josh Gatt, we talked to Josh Gatt a few weeks ago, and he admitted, like, we didn't run the ball enough last, last year. That's my bad. We need to do that more. And I think they're determined this year to run the football more. Absolutely. I mean, what, Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, for one of the unknowns I, that, that someone mentioned that you just brought up is I think Michigan needs to develop someone that that other teams have to actually game plan against and, and actually strike fear in, in the opponents. I don't think Michigan has had that um, in, in the last couple of years. Someone that a, a receiver that can draw double teams, a, a running back that can do it all. Um, that forces the defense to, like they can't put their third best linebacker on him in coverage and be be okay. Uh, like I don't know who exactly could be that receiver. I would have to go with Cornelius Johnson if I had a guess. Um, it sounds like he could develop into that. Uh, a, I mean, Ronnie Belzer is their number one receiver heading into the year. But at this point in Ronnie's career, I think you, you're going to get a solid option. I don't think he's ever going to be a one, one the most athletic receiver. He's not going to draw many double teams. He's a reliable receiver for Michigan's offense. But if you want someone, Michigan needs someone that can stretch the field, um, that can really ter terrorize secondaries and, and really break some big plays. And if Michigan could get that from either, I don't know, Cornelius Johnson, Blake Corum is a running back. Uh, Hassan Haskins is, is a solid running back, but he doesn't offer much in the passing game. I think Blake and Donovan Edwards at some point could are multi-use backs that can – our dual threat back. So yeah, if Michigan is going to take that next step, I think they need someone to really uh, a step up and, and to evolve into a, a real dynamite player in the big 10. We, we asked Jamon green the other day, Jamon's expected to start a corner this year for Michigan, but we asked him about the receivers and he listed a couple guys, but the first guy he listed was Cornelius, Cornelius Johnson. He called him number six. Like he, he made it sound like Cornelius. And we've heard this from other folks. Cornelius is having quite a camp. Um, he had a good, good summer, good camp. We saw him at times last year do some good things, um, but I, I think the ceiling is very high for him. Now, Michigan, you know, has a, has a, has had a, you know, a checkered track, you know, um, pass trying to develop these receivers. You saw it with Donovan Peoples-Jones. You've seen it with maybe Nico Collins. Um, they, they've really got to bring Cornelius along. They've still got a couple years to do it, but I think other receiver group, he could be, he's thinking to be the guy to watch. I think he's got the highest ceiling. He is, the, I think, the most, most to gain. Um, so he's a guy to watch. And then you mentioned Hassan Haskins and I, he, I, I look, I was looking up some stats earlier today and, and they're fascinating because if you look at his year last year, yes, only played six games. He had 61 carry 375 yards, six touchdowns. But the stat to know here is, is, is yards after contact. Hassan averaged 6.1 yards per carry last year. 4.3 of those were after contact. So the guy has shown an ability to, um, you know, um, 
take on the tackle, but then keep going. And I think that's the type of running back Michigan's really lacked in the, in the past couple of years. Um, so look for him to get the ball a lot this year. I think they need to give him the ball more. And, uh, uh, and it's going to, I think, really balance things out, out for Michigan uh, offensively. Now, a lot of a lot of great points made. I mean, as as far as running backs, um, you know, as you mentioned, like Josh Gaddis, the offensive coordinator, uh, you know, he he said that they they need to run the ball more. I'll, I'll say this: an offensive coordinator who doesn't speak to a you know commitment to running the football would would be the first. But he has a valid point. Michigan was sixth in the Big Ten in yards per carry last year, so you know, good. You know, thirteenth in attempts per game. Like they weren't doing it as much as you thought they should, given their success. Now. Part of that is, of course, you know, falling behind in, in games and things like that. But you kind of get where where he's coming from there. Um, and then, yeah, as far as the receivers, uh, Cornelius Johnson is my guy. I mean, I, I think that's the guy that that has to kind of be that true number one type. Like Ronnie Bell is probably maybe going to have the most catches and, and the best stats on this team. He, he's proven. But, you know, to, to Ryan's point earlier about like, you know, a guy that puts fear in opposing defenses like is Ronnie Bell that guy? It's not a knock on him, but he's just like really solid, really good. And it's great to have a couple guys like that, but you still need that kind of game breaker type, you know, that, that type that, you know, NFL teams are looking at as, you know, an early round pick or whatever. Um, and I think Cornelius Johnson's probably the best shot at being that guy. Um, and, and that'll be, that'll be huge in, in figuring out, you know, the, the ceiling for Michigan's offense. You know, the more we talk about the offense, the more optimistic I become about them. You just wish you would have seen more of them last year. You wish you would have seen a quarterback. They move them down the field, guys that could up front, that could stay healthy and then, you know, make it not fall behind early on so they could run the ball more. But like they have pieces there. There are guys there that that have the ability. They have what they think is a is a stable quarterback, someone who can move them down the field and score. Maybe this is the year where Josh Gaddis' offense really takes that leap. I, I think they need it to happen. Whether it happens, I don't know. But it almost seems it, every year we talk about the receivers and on their high heel, their high ceilings and needing needing to take a next step. But this year, I mean, it could be. I, I, I don't know. It's it almost seems like they have the right pieces in place, but they've really got to start fast and and and, and find that momentum early on. And I think that's where that week two game against Washington is, is so key. I think this is a, there's a, another good point here. Uh, I think Timothy brought, brought up a good question about how much of an impact Mike Hart, Hart will have on the running back room and their development. And just uh, I think last week, Aaron, it was we talked to Blake Corum and he was like, it, it's making a huge difference to have a guy that excelled at the college level like Mike Hart did now teaching the running back room. It's like, he's asking him every day, all right, I want to work on my patience. What, what drills can I do to do this? Mike Hart will give him a drill. I want to work on my bursts or something like that. Mike, Mike Hart will give him a drill. No disrespect to Jay Harbaugh. I mean, he, he brought in some, some really nice uh, running back recruits, but he didn't have the college career like Mike Hart did. So I think, I think that there could be, uh, that could be an improvement there with, with Mike Hart on staff. And then as far as receivers, I mean, Dalen Baldwin is someone that, you know, is absolutely someone to watch. I see someone mentioned him in the comments as well, you know, a transfer, uh, you know, that could, that could potentially uh, be that, be that guy uh, as well. So, you know, Aaron talking about getting more optimistic, you know, about it, the more you talk, they're like, you know, we're up to, we're up to, we're up from seven and five to eight and four here at seven twenty. you know, by the end of this thing, who knows, 10, 11 wins are possible for Michigan. So we'll just, let's kind of keep it rolling here, but um Okay, we've got we've got more trivia coming up, some some more videos, but the, the next topic I want to talk about is uh, sort of this coaching staff because it all it all connects to everything we've been saying uh, under Jim Harbaugh because it's it's new. He's got six new hires. He's gonna, he's he's you know overhauled his staff from from last year, and you know there, there's a lot of stats and numbers that we can point to with Jim Harbaugh that I think Michigan fans know or are tired of hearing. I mean, they know he hasn't been in Ohio State. You know, it's three and three against Michigan State now with some real you know, face plants, um, Michigan is 11 and 10 over their last 21 games, 11 and 10. Uh, that is, that is not Michigan that, that people expect. Um, but one way to, you know, try to shake things up is by bringing new people into the building and, and Jim Harbaugh did that. What do you think sort of the, the net effect will, will be on that? We can start with Aaron. Well, he obviously needed to make the changes. I think to, to save his job, I think there was pressure on him to change defensively especially um you know jim like 
if you recall the last couple of years, Jen, Jim defended Don Brown at every corner, you know, every point, every question he defended, he called him the best assistant coach he's ever had, all, all that stuff. Um, but there was a real, realization made that something needed to change defensively from a philo- philosophical standpoint, from an X's and O's standpoint. Uh, and, and quite frankly, they just needed an injection of, of new life, new energy. And I think that's what they found in Mike McDonald. He's not as rah-rah or as like animated as Don Brown was. And in fact, I don't think you're going to find anyone that as, as anim- is as animated as Don Brown. But um, he brings in that NFL pedigree, that guy who's been around a while. He, he's, an, he's clearly an X's and O's guy. You know, I remember when he first came in and, and talking to folks that coached with him, around him, for him. Um, he's, he's a smart guy. He knows what he's doing. Uh, he has a philosophy, you know, he, he came in under the Ravens. So he, he's very much, um, you know, taught under that system. I think that's what they're trying to bring here. They brought, they brought in some very, you know, like-minded individuals, George Hilo, we just talked to for the first time today, actually, he was very enlightening. Um, and, and I could see why players would like, like playing for him. And then clink scale, Steve clink scale, I think is going to be the key here. I mean, this is a guy who's been around the college game for a while. He's, um, you know, orchestrated very good um, secondaries. He's coached in the SEC. He's a very good recruiter, something Michigan really lacked you know, in the secondary from a coaching perspective. So he's, I think, the key guy to all of this because Michigan's secondary really needs to make a, take a next step this year if Michigan's defense wants to, wants to get better. But I guess the key, you know, key behind all these changes is it, it's just they needed change. They needed some new life. They needed some new minds in there. Uh, and, and I think that's what they got. They got. Um, obviously Ron Bellamy, I think was an interesting addition again, from a recruiting perspective, uh, he's, he'd never coached, you know, college before, but he brings in new life. He, he's very, he's a very charismatic individual and in talking to players the last few, cause I think Ryan can agree with this, te- this Testament, but like they clearly are, you know, ramped up with these new guys. There's, there's a new energy and new life in the building, whether that translates to wins or success this year, hang on, let's see about that. But there's clearly a new, um, new, new life there in Chad Beckler. Yeah, along those le- lines, I want to ask you, I, I forget who said it today, but someone said, yeah, like the new coaches are, are chest bumping people on, on the practice field, diving in piles with the players and stuff like that. Who do you think that we weren't told who that is, but who do you what assistance do you think would, would, would might be able, might be doing that? Probably McDonald or Hilo, their yeah. younger guy. And that's the thing, too. These guys are a lot younger, um, you, you know, and that's no, no shot at the, the past staff, but they're just that's just a fact, you know, so they're they're more there's more more energy, like I said, and I think that's rubbing off on the players. That's kind of what they want to see. And it's, you know, whether it translates to success, I, I don't know. Um, but th- they're trying something different. Jim wanted to try something different. And it seems early on, we, at least it's working. Um, you know, Aaron, you spoke to Joel Klatt, uh, at the Fox, you know, sports college football analyst, uh, you know, at big 10 media days. And, you know, he, he addressed, uh, you know, you asked him about the, the overhaul of the staff and you know, he, he made some good points about it. He looked at past precedent. Uh, he mentioned, you know, two two you know high profile coaches in in Mac Brown uh, and Bob Stoops. Uh, Mac Brown at Texas, you know, tried this and you know brought in a bunch of new assistants, some some high profile ones, and it didn't really work out for him at the end of his tenure. Uh, Bob Stoops did the same thing, and and it did. Like there are, um, you know, there's there's it, it could go either way, um, you know, and he, he definitely, he, he got younger, you know, definitely a focus more on, I think some, some, some hands-on teaching and recruiting is, is definitely a, a factor there. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, if that doesn't work out, like who's it, is it going to fall on? It's going to fall on, on Jim Harbaugh. So uh, that that's the thing to watch. And, you know, I know I got a lot of questions in, in my, uh, you know, VIP event before we did this about, about Harbaugh and about his, his future at Michigan. Um, we don't need to spend too much time on it here, but you know, as Aaron and Ryan, you know, you can, you can jump in as far as, you know, he, he's got a contract extension, um, but the, the buyout is Michigan friendly, at least, you know, with each passing year. So, you know, in two or three years, if, you know, you're not seeing improvement, it wouldn't be crazy that the Michigan goes in a, in another direction. Yeah. You know, folks seem to think this is do or die year for Jim Harbaugh and it, that may be the case, but I, I really think he's got two years left. You know, mm-hmm. he's, he's got, I don't think they go through all these changes and hire these, you know, new defensive coordinator, new staff and pull the plug on him after year one. Now, if this year goes South early and it's a disaster, perhaps, um, but I, I really think he's going to get two years to try and right the ship. And, and then after that, Michigan will have to make a decision. If they're, if they're still stuck in neutral and going eight and four, nine and three, he probably look somewhere, look elsewhere. Um, but if they can show improvement, if they can, you know, perhaps exceed expectations this year and go, you know, maybe eight 
for and show some life defensively that that'll set set up things nicely for next year but you're right you mentioned the buyout it's four million dollars after this year which is his new it's which is his new yearly salary to begin with so it's certainly um advantageous for michigan to pull the plug if they choose to do so i just i don't see it i don't really envision you know them doing it after year one after they made all these drastic changes and jim harbaugh committed to doing things differently defensively to do that 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 soon that said, I'm not, the, I'm not the court, I'm not, I'm not the athletic director. I don't make those decisions. Um, but the, the pressure is clearly on Jim Harbaugh. He knows that, you know, he was asked about the big to media days and he, not, you know, he said it. Yeah. The pressure. I, and I, I love it. I feed off of it. It's what I want to do. Um, so he, he knows the situations situation he is in. Uh, I've said it better myself. There you go. Uh, I want to, want to keep things moving. We do have, we do have, you know, a bunch of questions that are, that are piling up. I want to, I want to get to them. Um, but let's, uh, Let's go into another another couple of trivia questions here, and these are for hats. Uh, so you're going to get University of Michigan uh, football hats if you if you get the first to get these right. And you know, as I maybe I didn't mention, but you know, Aaron Ryan and I we kind of collaborated. Each came up with a couple of questions, and I will say this one I'm about to read is mine because it's kind of always been my my favorite trivia question. And a little hint is that it uh, it 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 recently got an update. There used to only be uh, three three schools that would be answers to this. And now there's four. So if that helps you out, here you go. You're probably just more confused at this point, but here's the question. The university of Michigan has produced both a super bowl winning quarterback, Tom Brady and a United States president, Gerald Ford. There are four other schools that can say the same name, those schools, just name the schools. Don't need the quarterbacks or the presidents uh, though. We will get into that of course, when the answer, but Four schools that have produced both a Super Bowl winning quarterback and a United States president. Drum roll. This might catch some folks. Yeah, nothing in the chat yet. I love a little stumper question. Crickets. <laughs> they're Googling. <laughs> they're, they're doing... Oh, yeah. yeah. This is a tough one, I guess, as far as time. It would take you a little time to probably yeah. think it through. Some good. good... Good ideas. Someone's mentioned mentioning put some at Michigan, put some astronauts in space too. Uh, man, I gotta go through it. I'm, I'm not seeing. I can't say I'm seeing it yet. How long do we give them? That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, this is a good question. Too good. That, that's so. a good question by Aaron. I'm saying how long we give them. A lot of Stanford. Yeah, you don't have. To, you don't have to mention. All right. I think we've got it. Yep. I think we've got it. I see it. Yes. I see the other four schools. They're there. Uh, so there we go. Uh, those schools are Delaware, Miami of Ohio, Navy, and Stanford. Those are the four other schools that have produced uh, both the Super Bowl winning quarterback and a uh, and United States president. Um, yeah, Miami of Ohio has two Bens, Ben Roethlisberger and Benjamin Harrison. Navy has Roger Staubach and Jimmy Carter. Stanford has two quarterbacks, actually, and Jim Plunkett and John Elway and Herbert Hoover as the president. And recently uh, joining this list is Delaware. They've had Joe Flacco, quarterback, for a while, and, and now they can, they can say they've got the president, too, and Joe Biden. So those are the other four schools that, that fit that bill. You win a hat for getting that right. Uh, second one won't take as long, I don't think, but I, I guess I don't know for sure. Uh, two members of the Michigan football team played under assistant coach Ron Bellamy at West Bloomfield High School. Can you name both? And the hint is that a third recently transferred to Kansas, but we don't need that one. We need two <laughs> members of the Michigan football team who played under a new assistant coach Ron Bellamy at West Bloomfield High. Who are they? Oh man, I thought this was going to be a quick one. I know, me too. Eh, people don't mm -hmm. always, you know. Yeah. Bellamy's means new, so it's not something they may be right. thinking about yet. West Bloomfield. Nailed it. You got there, one. There we go. You got, got one. one? Yeah. Yep. All right. Brian. Donovan Edwards and Makari Page are the answers to that question. All right, so we've got more trivia coming up later. Congratulations to whoever got that for their, your hat. Um, again, moderators will, will contact you and, and sort it all out. But uh, 
And I want to talk on recruiting a little bit. We just talked about, you know, Ron Bellamy and coaching at West Bloomfield High. Uh, you know, I, I guess we will definitely start with you, Ryan, because uh, this is kind of your one of your your specific beats for M Live uh, is Michigan football recruiting. Like, I guess where do you where do you even start? Where do we things stand? Are things going in a in a positive direction uh, under you know this this very new staff? And yeah, what what's the the main points for recruiting that people need to know right now? Well, there, there was a little bit of momentum in, in June, but uh, it's really died down here in the past month or so. Uh, Michigan's been stuck on 15 commits in the past since July 12th. Um, they've missed out on a couple top targets uh, at linebacker, especially with Sebastian Cheeks and Jeremy Patton. You know, there was a question earlier about Walter Nolan, who just named his top three yesterday, uh, did not include Michigan. He previously included Michigan in his top five last month. Um, that's the five-star defensive tackle from uh, Tennessee, the number one overall ranked recruit in the entire 2022 class. The exact type of player Michigan is looking for in, his, in their new 3-4 scheme, uh, a guy that can be plugged in in the middle of the nose tackle position, draw double teams, and be that run stuffer up in the, up, uh, in the middle. It uh, looks like he, he's um, going to look elsewhere now at their limiting or naming his top three schools of Tennessee, Georgia and um, Texas A&M thought Michigan had a shot uh, a little, a couple well, last month, even or two, couple, two months ago, he went, went to campus twice. Um, his, his, he has family in the Metro Detroit area. But again, I think the two key factors here is NIL, which I think Michigan is, is lacking a little bit in at this point. And just the, the stability of the program. I think that, like I mentioned earlier at the top of the show, Michigan needs to show progress on the field and a little bit more stability uh, in, in the in the coaching and the and the coaching staff as well um, to, to land some of these these top guys. I mean, right now they have the 15th class nationally, but its average is right on par with its 2018 class, which finished outside the top 20 nationally. So uh, a little bit alarming right now. I mean, obviously the five star cornerback and Will Johnson, huge get for Michigan. Um, could be a, an impact player right away. I mean, Michigan hasn't landed a, a cornerback of this caliber in quite some time. But outside of that, there's only two guys ranked inside the top 300. So um, still a long time before signing day. But I think if they win a few games uh, this fall or some big games this fall, maybe some guys that uh, aren't considering Michigan at the top of their list right now might uh, re, re, uh, circle back with Michigan and be like, all right, I, I, I can see myself a part of this program now. I think they're headed in the right direction. So it, we'll see what happens. Given the, the, the changes with the coaching staff, I, I, Michigan's really in a kind of a reset mode when it comes to recruiting. You've got guy, new coaches coming in, trying to establish relationships with high schools around you know, the area and new recruiting areas. Um, it, it, it's really tough for them right now. And it's going to be for probably for a little bit. And you've also, I think there's some hesitation too, right? With, especially on the defensive side of the ball, you've got high school kids being told like, Hey, we want you, we're going to use you this way. Um, but they haven't really seen it. You know, I think they want, they want to see some games. They want to see how Michigan plays defense before they commit to anything. And look, it's going to put Michigan behind the eight ball for this year. And that's natural when you, when you drastically change a coaching staff, um, you know, when, when Josh, G when, before Josh Gaddis came in, it took Michigan a little bit, a little bit of time to get going off from their offensive recruiting standpoint. So it's going to take them a bit. If you look at the track records for Steve Klinkscale um, and, you know, he, he's going to get some guys. He's going to get some good players in the secondary. Ron Bellamy, I think he gives a good ad. Yes, this is his first year in college, but he's got good ties in the Metro Detroit area. But I think once they establish their identity and defense, it's going to go a long way with, with recruiting. But for right now, there isn't much to, to, to look at because Michigan hasn't played a game. They haven't played a game under, under McDonald. Uh, practices aren't open. So there, there's just a lot of unknowns. And right now that, that doesn't help with recruiting. And another thing too, uh, with this new defensive scheme, they have to, they're recruiting a different type of player on defense, so they're trying to recruit guys that have already built relationships with other programs, other coaches for the past two three years, because that's when recruiting for the at least the top guys begins. So they're trying to wedge their foot in the door uh, with guys that have already made a lot of progress with other schools too. So yeah, I, I can't say it's surprising that Michigan has, has faced some struggles. Uh, this cycle, uh, it's kind of expected. I mean, even in, after the 2017 season when they were eight and five, that's when they signed that that 2018 class that um, that wasn't really highly rated. So yeah, it's not surprising, but 
I think things could change a little bit with, uh, with a strong showing this season. So that's why I mentioned that there's a lot riding on, on the 2021 season for Michigan football. Yeah. I mean, Michigan recruiting, it's, it's like good. It's kind of like downfield product to a certain extent, at least in the earlier hardball years, you know, good, but not great for every five star they're getting like Ohio state's getting two or three or four. Right. I mean, that that's the problem. They're just, they've got, they've got a real, uh, you know, beast in, in their, in their division, of course, um, you know, not to mention some of the, you know, the other, you know, the Penn States of the world that they recruit at a high level too. I don't want to close the book on recruiting yet. We can come back to it with some, um, you know, questions and specific topics, but uh, you know, I don't want to run out of time for some of the other segments we've got planned. And, and the next one up is uh, Aaron's interview uh, with, with Mike Martin as well. Another former Wolverine, Aaron, you can, you can tease it if there's anything you want to say or just tell them to hit play. You tell me. Yeah, I know. We talked a little bit about his, his time at Michigan. He had a unique journey because he originally committed to Lloyd Carr, um, played under, you know, Rich Rodriguez and then the first shooter Brady Hoke. So he kind of went through staff changes and the like, I, obviously uh, he played at Michigan four or five years, all big 10 guy. Um, so he, he's a lot of experience to lean on uh, brand new father, by the way, he gave birth, his wife gave birth, I think yesterday, his ba- baby boy, congratulations to him. Uh, but yeah, we can, we can tee up that interview with, uh, with Mike Martin. We're here at the Michigan football kickoff event presented by the University of Michigan Flint. I'm joined by Mike Martin, a former defensive tackle at, on the Michigan football team, uh, played at Michigan from 2008 to 2011, uh, former team captain, two-time All-Big Ten honoree, and third-round pick of the Tennessee Titans in the 2020, 2012 NFL Draft. Mike, thanks for joining us. Um, as Michigan gets ready to start this football season, I'm wondering as a former player, as a former member of the football program at Michigan, what was camp like for you and kind of the build up to the season? Yeah, camp, camp was one of the hardest camps I've ever gone through, actually. It was one of those break you down, build you back up type of camps. And I remember being, uh, you know, mentally beaten down, but that's what a good camp is you really see what your team has and what the the where can you take a team how far can you take them so you get an idea of what you can do in the season and then every week you go by in the season and you build on that <clears throat> so you know we did a great job of just playing football and practicing real life uh moments and then it was uh, essentially a lot easier once you get in that game it's not a shock factor it's something that your team's mental preparation has really gotten you to that point and you're able to build on something special and the second question you asked you asked another question what was that when you're running through the tunnel and and touching the banner at michigan stadium what what's that like as a player yeah i mean for me growing up and watching it on tv as a kid and growing up uh, in the family that i did it was something that I felt like a fan that had a lot of say in how the game went and when I became a player. So it was a very special thing. And it's this day, every time I go back, I mean, I had my baby shower photos were done at the big house just a couple of weeks ago. So it's a special place to me and to our family. What are some of the best memories of your time at Michigan as a member of the football team? A lot of them. You know, I can't say a lot of them I can. It's like, you know, it's those those moments in the locker room with your guys. It's going to class, you know, just having conversations on the bus, all the things that make it, you know, a special thing over a period of four years. But the the big moments that a lot of people were able to see, you know, really my senior year was a culmination of going through a lot of tough uh, things and a lot of adversity. And it really was a culmination of Bo's quote of those who stay will be champions because you know having 20 plus guys in my recruiting class my freshman year and having more than half of those guys be gone by the time we were seniors the class didn't look the same and you had to go through some tough stuff but then senior year going undefeated in Ann Arbor at the big house you know beating Virginia Tech in the Sugar Bowl and being able to beat Ohio State at home as a senior was a special thing and, and being able to do it with your guys. It was, I'll never forget that. You had a unique journey at 
to Michigan and at Michigan. I mean, you committed to Michigan when Lloyd Carr was head coach in 2007. You played under Rich Rodriguez from 28 to 2010, 2008 to 2010, and you played un, under Brady Hoke in his first year at Michigan. As a player, what is the key to adjusting to that many coaches and different coordinators and different personalities, especially with Michigan bringing in a new defensive coordinator this, this year? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I was really lucky to have coaches at the high school level teach me about going through adversity and just controlling what you can control. So if you just have the mindset of all the X factors and all the outside variables that have nothing to do with me, if I just approach it with an attitude of I'm going to have the best attitude moving forward with this situation, whether it be on the field, off the field, that's all you can do. And if you think about all the other stuff, you're going to chip yourself up with the next step that's in front of you. So like you said, all the coaching changes I had at Michigan, going through all of that. And then, I mean, even beyond into the NFL, I mean, I, I, you know, I had three different head coaches, you know, it's a Mike Munchak. We had Ken Wisenhunt that was the OC at the, you know, in San Diego. And then we had Ken Malarkey who took over for him after a season and a half. So Dick LeBeau is a D coordinator of mine. I had Jerry Gray and I had Greg Williams in the NFL. So three head coaches, three D coordinators, and then Michigan, it's a, a lot of changeover, but the consistent part of it was always my, my mindset. So whenever the, the waves were shaking around me, there was a, a calmness and a peacefulness internally. And that's what these guys got to learn to do. And they got to come into the season knowing that there's going to be a lot of waves, but if they trust in each other as teammates, then, you know, they're going to have a good result. Mike Martin, man, can, can you got any eligibility left? That guy looks like he definitely get on the field and still take down some ball carriers. Yeah, he's he's a he's a buff dot buff dude. <laughs> um, like I said, we we want to you know we want to keep it moving. We've got some questions uh, to get to. We've got some trivia questions to to offer you guys for some more prizes as as we wind down here with with our portion of the event before the auction. Uh, kicks in, but uh, let's talk defense and, and, and special teams too. Um, you know, one of the questions we got was, you know, who might make uh, an impact, you know, in, in the return game, you know, as a kick returner, punt returner, Giles Jackson, you know, is had that role last year as, as you know, a kick returner, um, no longer with the program he transferred. So uh, yeah, any names to, to watch uh, in special teams? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because we asked Jay Harbaugh about that today. Uh, he didn't have a a name decided yet in the, in the kick return game. He mentioned like a list of six or eight. So that tells me they're still trying to figure it out. Um, but it, it's familiar to guys like Corum, AJ Henning, Roman Wilson, the, the, the speedier guys. I'm surprised Andrew Anthony's name didn't come up or did it, Ryan? I don't remember. No, it did not. Yeah, I was yeah. wanting to follow up with Jay about that. But I think Andrew would be perfect for that because we've heard a lot about his speed and his, his athleticism. I think he'd be a perfect returner, but apparently not. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of guys there. They haven't figured that out yet. Uh, it's still to be determined. Um, how, okay. So kind of zooming back a little bit, the defense in general, we've talked about, it's a new, it's a new scheme. Will there be some growing pains? Uh, you know, what will it look like? Uh, but just more generally basic, like how good do you think this defense will be? What, what, what are the strengths where there's some, some holes? Uh, yeah, well, I definitely want to hear from, from both of you guys on this. I, I think there's, there's a lot, lot to be said here. I, the defense is a great unknown with this team. I mean, it, it, this team is only going to go as far as the defense takes them, and, and obviously didn't take them very far last year. But with the new scheme and the new way they're playing, I, I, I think there's some, some reason to be optimistic here. The problem is, and I, I brought this up, I feel like I bring this up every week on the podcast, and I'll say it again, like it's not going to be rainbows and sunshine out of the get, get, gate. You're going to see mistakes. These guys are being thrown like so much at, there's so much being thrown at these guys. I mean, we talked to Daxton Hill last week and, you know, obviously he plays safety, but they have a moving corner and, and nickel and things. And he's still trying to grasp, grasp everything. And that's an experienced guy who's played a bunch and started a ton and probably one, arguably one of their best defenders. So it's going to take them some time to just, I think, become cohesive as a unit. I mean, look at a couple of years ago when, when Josh Gaddis came in as new OC and they were a stack group starting quarterback coming back. And it took them like six, eight, six games to get going. They're fumbling the football mistakes. Like don't be surprised if the defense, you know, stubs their toe quite a few times early on. I, I think you're going to see some, some, some struggles early. Um, they are going to do some things differently, which I think is a good thing. I mean, they've got some good pieces coming back. Aiden Hutchinson 
on the outside as an outside linebacker is, I think, a good idea. It, they can get him loose and get him to the quarterback. That will help Michigan because the pass rush struggled last year. Um, and that was obviously a big part of Don Brown's defense. But if they can, if they can, you know, use Aiden Hutchinson, use Dax Hill as a kind of a free roaming safety and, and a playmaker, um, that that's gonna that's gonna bode well. Now they they need to put everything together, but there, there's a lot there's a lot to like here. I just don't think time is on their side th- this season. Part of the pessimism too that I kind of reflected in our predictions is there's still a lot of unknowns with this defense, even personnel wise. I mean. Yeah, Nikai Hill Green was named a, a starter, an inside linebacker starter today. He's played zero downs on defense at the college level. So you you have no, we don't see practice. So we have no idea what to expect from him. Yeah, he's been getting a bunch of praise, but again, it, it, it's really tough for us to kind of gauge what type of impact he'll have. Same with like RJ Moan, if Dax plays a lot of nickel this year and, and they go with Brad Hawkins and RJ Moten at safety. RJ has not played a down of college football yet. So again, a lot of unknowns. I mean, maybe these guys turn out to be impact players right away and pleasant surprises, but it's hard to expect that right off the bat considering, yeah, it's, it's tough to play college football at the big 10 level and make an impact right away. So they're going to be relying on some inexperienced guys. They do have some, I mean, both their cornerbacks from last year will be back. Um, We'll see if if Vincent Gray maintains his, his starting job or, or if uh, DJ Turner will, will leapfrog him, uh, him on the depth chart. But, yeah, I think there, there's definitely reasons for concern on this defense and kind of the biggest reason why I put their projected record at 7-5. and five. Virtually no depth at inside linebacker, too. You know, so if Josh Ross goes out hurt, Nakai Hill Green gets hurt, uh, they're just – I mean, Junior Colson's there. These names come up, but he's another – guy a true freshman hasn't played college ball so like you and he's been hurt doing. for part of camp too that we found out today he just returned to practice yesterday or today so i mean that, mm-hmm. that's never good for a, a true freshman he needs as many reps as he can in practice so uh, another hit to the depth early on michigan needs to stay healthy and hope a lot of things go right and and they can be maybe be decent defensively look the defensive line i think could be good i mean they got more depth inside up uh, front and defensive tackle I, I think they're a lot better than they were last year and a couple of years ago so i think they'll they should do a decent job stopping the run uh i, I just don't know how they're going to handle the, the the pass game the, the the slants over the middle um the shots down the field uh how they react or if you've got a top guys. number number one receiver and elite guy i mean those guys gave michigan trouble last year they picked you know they could Teams could pick on Michigan there. Yep, exactly. So they're going to they're, they're gonna do a lot of things. They're going to play more zone. They're gonna probably going to play with more five or six defensive backs in the field. They're going to do some things, which is good, because we didn't see that a lot last year with Don Brown. He was didn't want to do it. That wasn't his, in his vocabulary. Wasn't his, he was something he was comfortable with. So they're going to, you're going to see some outside the box, different things. Um, whether it works, you know, I, I don't know. And this is very much, in my opinion, a very uh, a test year for the defense to see what they have. And, and, and trying to build. And I talked about that earlier. If they can end the season on a good note defensively, I think that's the biggest win for Michigan. Because I think the offense could be, could be good. You know, they, they've shown they can be explosive. They can throw the football to Cade McNamara. Um, but this defense is really going to be uh, uh, the key to this, this, this team and their success or, or failure. Um, we've, got, we've got some trivia questions I want to get to uh, before we sign off. And, and then some uh, you know, questions from, from our from our participants here, if we, if we, if we have some time, uh, you, you guys can let me know in the chat, but we'll, we'll start with the trivia questions to, to give away some, some, some things, shirts, a couple more shirts. We're going to give away, uh, with, with these two, uh, trivia questions. This is a, a recruiting question during Jim Harbaugh's tenure, the Wolverines have signed 32 high school recruits from the state of Michigan and 23 from Florida, the most of any States, two States are tied for the third most with 14. What are they? So Michigan is pulled from Michigan and from Florida the most. What oh, are the wow, next look two? Look at that, Stephen Stephen Adams getting it quick. Boom! Wow. All right, I thought that one, one might stump some people. I guess not. Yeah, well only, done, Stephen. It's only so many states, and yeah, yeah. the Ohio and New well, Jersey. Ohio, they haven't they haven't they gotten one over the last past past two cycles. So it was more uh, 20, 2019 was their big Ohio haul. Um, and New Jersey, the same thing. They haven't gotten as many in, in recent years since uh, Partridge and uh, Campanile left. But well, well yeah, let, and let's let's let that translate then into into a question we got about. And, and Ryan, I assume this is the one you're you're kind of referencing to me earlier about you know what what coach has the best chance of going into Ohio and, and, and getting some kids. Is that is that the one you were 
um, yeah, yeah, that's, thinking about I, answering. Yeah. Cause Michigan did hire, you know, some, some new assistants and uh, yeah. What's your, what's your take on that as it relates to Ohio? I mean, I think you have to look right at Steve Flinksdale, uh, an Ohio native, a guy that has recruited the area since he started coaching at Toledo in 2009. Uh, Metro Detroit was his primary area when he was at Kentucky, but um, the guy has relationships there. It's turned to be, and it's a different ball game, recruiting in Ohio and recruiting against Ohio State. I mean, the last guy Michigan signed in the 20 last year's class, Rod Moore, he didn't have an Ohio State offer. So if Michigan wants to go in there and really make an impact and win battles against Ohio State, I think they need to show something on the field too, no matter who, what assistant is there, um, just because Ohio State has just had such a stranglehold in the past uh, several years and under Ryan Day with, with their top in-state guys. So I think you needed results on the field and some relationships with those high school coaches in, New, in Ohio as well to see, start seeing the difference again there. Michigan really thought they'd get in in Ohio with, when Al Washington got here, the old linebackers coach. He stayed one year and it, it, he left. They, they thought Ed Warner could to make some moves in there. He got a couple of guys but didn't do a ton. Uh, Ohio's always been tough for Michigan. And, and, you know, to their defense, they haven't spent as much time in there. Now you could argue whether that's the right move or not, but you know, I, I do, you're right. I, I think they, they have to spend more time and make more of an effort there um, with, with Clink's going staff. I mean, looking in, in 2013, I mentioned this in, in uh, the VIP session, but I mean, they, they signed nine players in the 2013 class from Ohio, including six ranked inside the top 300 nationally. So, I mean, they had, they, under Brady Hope, they were able to get in there and get some of the top players. I mean, whether it was Taco Charlton or, or Jake Budd or Mike McRae, Davion Smith, there were some guys there that, that turned out to be impact players, but that just been too far, too few and far between um, under, under Jim Harbaugh. We got, we got some question, couple questions we can try to rip through here real quick. Um, one is about the success of other sports at, at Michigan um, and whether that's put any, you know, pressure on, on, Harbaugh, uh, the question asked if, you know, to remain in, at, at Michigan, I'm not sure it puts any more pressure on, on him to want to, to want to stay and do well. I think, I think that's already clear that, that that's what he wants. Um, I think it is interesting. I think it puts more, it does put more pressure from the outside and there's more, there's more uh, questions and skepticism and, and just confusion, I guess, about why it hasn't worked for Jim Harbaugh, especially when you look at Jawan Howard. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of similarities there as far as, you know, star players from the school, um, you know, who are hired, you know, from the pro ranks and, uh, you know, one has just hit the ground running and, and gotten Michigan to just an elite place, um, you know, and, and is crushing it on the recruiting trail. Um, and it just hasn't quite happened for, uh, you know, for Harbaugh, but, uh, yeah, um, I want to get to our, I, I want to get to our last trivia question before we wrap it up here. Um, and that is Michigan. So get your, get your fingers ready at the keyboard, Michigan has two scholarship players from European countries on the team this year. Can you name both? Name both the, the players. You don't need to, to name their country, but we'll, we'll tell you. Bonus points if you do. Bonus, yeah, bonus. Pat on the back. You're, you're getting a shirt. You're not getting anything else. <laughs> got it sure. already. Somebody's Evan already Anderson, got well it. Done. Yep, and the second yep. person. A Jabo yep. from Jabo Scotland. from Scotland. Yep, and Julius Wellskoff from Germany. There you go. So very good. Um, absolutely. Uh, well, well, Ryan and, and Aaron, uh, it was, it was great talking to you uh, on this platform and I hope everyone, you know, in, enjoyed our presentation. If you're thinking, Hey, I like, I like this conversation, but I don't need to see their faces. The Wolverine <laughs> confidential podcast is for you. So please find it. It's wherever you, uh, you know, you find podcasts. Um, we hope you hope you'll give that a listen and we'll be recording more leading up to the season and then during, and please continue to read our work at mlive.com slash Wolverine. So I'm going to pass it back to our host, uh, Eric, uh, to tell you a little bit more about the auction and then wrap up here. Thank you, my friend. Guys, that was uh, that was absolutely awesome. And yeah, if you have not checked out Wolverine Confidential, make sure you do that uh, while we are doing all of this stuff. We've got the auction that is going on. So I need to bring Q back in and see where we are. Q, where are you and uh, where are we at? Uh, well, I'm currently uh, hanging out in Flint right now, uh, is where I'm at, but uh, where we're sitting at I with mean, the I didn't mean literally, I meant like where we are with the auction, but thank you for sharing. Where are you physically <laughs> in, in the, no, where in the world? No, so uh, what we've got right now is things have been heating up during this whole entire thing, including the, 
the fact that I've been getting outbid left and right uh, on the one that I was trying to go for. But we have raised $538 thus, thus far on the auction. Um, that that signed football by Jim Harbaugh, uh, Lloyd Carr, and Jake Longs is, is topping out right now at 293 We've got the football signed by Lloyd Carr at 185 and the one by Jay Freely is sitting at 60 at this moment. So uh, that is where we currently are. I'd love to see if we can get ourselves up to 600. Uh, I'd love to get that over to Chad, uh, the Chad Tuff Foundation. Absolutely. So we are going to be uh, keeping the auction open for a couple more minutes. And before we dive into that finale, uh, we have a couple of special guests we'd love to share with you right now. So uh, let's do that. And Q and I'll be right back. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Jay Chesson. I hope you guys are ready for an amazing season this year. Uh, we got Miss Michigan on the clock. Uh, I wish my boys in blue best of luck. Coach Harbaugh, best of luck. I love those guys. We'll be rooting for them no matter what. And let's just come out and show our support this season. Go Blue. Hello, Michigan fans. I hope you're excited as I am for this season 2021. I've been over to practice uh, a few times. I went to one of their team meetings and everything I see is positive. Coach Harbaugh has uh, got a staff that is really strong in the teaching of the game and uh, the intensity of it, the, uh, all the things it takes to be a winning team. So uh, their work ethic is great, the enthusiasm. Uh, the team first attitude is prevalent and uh, Coach Harbaugh has uh, put this team ready to go and I am so excited. Uh, I look forward to watching this team and I uh, look forward to trying to help them win by cheering as hard as I can. Go Blue, go Chad Tuff. All right, Q, let's uh, check in with you one last time before we wrap this up. Where are we at, my friend? I'm just running the totals right now, feeling like John King right now at the, at the magic board. Uh, we are, there's, we're at 543. We've got a total that we've raised. And I tell you what, that Lloyd Carr football, those videos must be doing something because uh, <laughs> Uh, that's the one where we keep chipping at it. We're just seeing, we're seeing people bid each other out by a dollar, five dollars, and ten. So let's keep that going. Make sure you hop in there and get that. We've got a couple of minutes left on this bad boy. Yeah, Q. So let me uh, do a couple things here and I'll check right back with you in a couple minutes. So we're going to keep this open for a couple more minutes. If you want to donate directly to the Chad Tuff organization, that link is in the chat. And there are more ways that you can support the Chad Tuff Foundation. And one of them is to go for a run and participate in Run Tough. Hi everyone, um, it is Run Tough for Chad Tough time again, and we are here to encourage you to sign up. And I've got a special guest here today, Papa Carr. Hi, Papa. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everybody out there. We're looking forward to running hard, to running fast, and the running for Chad and all those young people that we're trying to save. Exactly. And this year we're launching, you can have your own team or you can join Coach Carr's team. Uh, so come join our family, join Coach Carr's team and let's all run tough. We see, need your help. We do and we'll see you in September. Thanks. All right, one last time, let's check in with Q. Q, what are the uh, final numbers for today after two hours of doing this? I am hitting the refresh button, and as it sits right now, Eric, we broke the $600 mark. So we are at 643. Someone went big on that Lloyd Carr football, and that bumped all the way up to 250 bucks. In addition, the uh, one with Jay Freely is sitting at 100, and the one with uh, all three signatures is sitting at 293. So I want to thank everybody for uh, participating in the auction and help us raise some money for Chad Tuff. Auction's still open, so if you want one of them, go ahead and hop in there and uh, snag that your chance at getting it.
Thank you, my friend. You did an amazing job. And also thank you to our panelists. If you enjoyed today's event, as I said earlier, you can join Ryan, Aaron, and Andrew on the Wolverine Confidential Podcast, which you can find anywhere that you get your podcast. And that link is being dropped in the chat right now if you want to download it to your phone so you can listen to an episode uh, before you sign off for the evening. And thank you once again to our presenting sponsor, University of Michigan Flint. You can check out all of the opportunities of the University of Michigan Flint has to offer at umflint.com. And for Q and the rest of us at MLive, I want to wish you an awesome 2021 Wolverine football season. We will catch you next time. Have a wonderful evening. We'll talk soon. See you guys.